Well, hello. As I was finishing up this pattern for a frame, I thought to myself, <laughs> it took a lot to get to this point. And when you look online and you look in books, you can find a lot of information about carving, but not so much about carving on a picture frame. It's one thing to find a pattern and have it be on a flat surface. It's a completely other thing to have it and go on a pattern that is an undulating surface like this one is and then has architectural details. So I thought, now that I finally got this thing figured out, I should share it because I, I believe in trying to share you know what I have I don't believe in keeping it secret so somebody else doesn't do it and by the way this is just how I do it and anybody that's watching it if you have some suggestions or ways that you do it that you think are better I would be more than welcome to to hear about those so the first thing you got to figure out is where do you get a pattern well personally I like to borrow them from the internet so this is something I don't even remember where I got it, but I liked <clears throat> this little architectural leaf motif with the, the boss of the flower in there. So I thought I would like to put that on a frame. So my process is to take a screen grab, then drag this into my pages program, and then I know what my size is, use the rulers and, and make it the right size, and then take however that comes out, uh, run, print a piece of it, put it on, this is my favorite material for patterns, it's the uh, plastic that you buy your salad in at Costco or, or wherever you happen to go. And so I will use spray adhesive and stick it on there. And then what's, what I like about it, I use the chisel that I think I need for the design, and then I note on the pattern which is which. So I know that here I need a 420, here I need a 512, you know, whatever it happens to be. The beauty of this stuff, is that you can pretty easily press it into your shape, whatever you have, and because it is flexible, now I know I have a mirror image. So it's stiff enough to hold the pencil, but yet not so stiff that you can't, that you can't bend it. So I've done that with this one. Then you probably all know that trick or technique where you take a very soft pencil, uh, in this case a 6B and some graph paper, or I'm sorry, tracing paper, and now I can place this on here, line it up. When I do one side, the lead that's built up on the other side shows, so that gives me an indication. Again, these will be determined by the sweep of whatever chisel I have. So when I looked at this, I thought it needs a little bit more. This is a 20 by 24 frame. So I made this, this is my first design or my, my sample piece, I just take some pieces of my, my molding that I have made for me and I miter it together and I wanted to have this little fancy, let's call it a giha. I wanted to add just a little bit more to it. So again, I did the same process. I took the pattern, I drew it, this one I pretty much drew freehand except for the curves and glued it onto the uh, plastic as you can see and cut it out. So then once I got that done, my next process was how do I locate it? Well, when I did this sample, I just fiddle farted around with it, that's a technical term, until I got it to where I thought it looked right, and I did it, and I discovered that it was approximately 10 and 3 quarter inches from the end of the frame, so I measured that and made a line, and it was about 7 eighths of an inch from this bead, so again, I drew another line with that. Okay, in theory, what that tells me is if I get the end of the motif on this line, the tip of it on this line, and it bends over to the flower in the, in the miter, then that should be pretty much where it should belong. This was another problem, another little predicament to solve. As you can see, this piece here, it just wants to go all over. So, what I did, and here you start wondering, do I have enough fingers? I tried to do it on both sides, but that just didn't work. So I only did the bottom of this piece. And as I came around, obviously, I do this side. And I don't know if you can read it or not, but for example, this curvature right here, I cut with this set number seven or a seven sweep 12 millimeter 
gouge and I wrote that on there. So as I work my way around this frame, every one of those will have as close to the same curvature as I can get. Okay, so many times like I did here, of course I, I know that you're watching, so you may have to sketch in a little bit to get it to go all the way around to where you want it. And the, the chisel is gonna cut it exactly how you want. Now here's the thing again, this trying to hold this piece here on this line not have it move and trace it exactly i tried several different ways to do it now i know some people out there have the skill set they can just draw a parallel line that's not in my skill set so what i ended up doing is i took a pair of dividers and i set the dividers for the spacing or the distance across that ribbon we'll call it and next trying very carefully to stay as on that line as I can and maintain like a, I guess it'd be perpendicular to it. I use these, I can see I'm getting off a little bit there. So let's see if I can get here. You know, this is, we're not doing CNC, we're doing a freehand, hand-carved corner on a frame. So if there's a little bit of variation, that's fine. That lets somebody know that, hey, this thing wasn't spit out by a machine. But now I have just enough of a scribed line where I can get the pencil in. And that gives me the shape that I want. You, you can see, maybe you can see, it's not perfect by any shape of the, any imagination, but it's very, very close. So now the next thing is when I cut this out, I have to maintain that line as, as closely as I can. And this is another problem. On a flat surface, you could take maybe a chip carving knife, hold it the way you're supposed to, and work that line all the way around but for me anyway there's this up here and a down here and there's beads here i just couldn't get it so i also have a long bent small v chisel to like a parting tool but even that as you're working around here this surface goes this way this surface goes this way and i find that cutting it it's very very tricky and the v chisel by its nature cuts pretty deep so it's, it's hard to manipulate. If, if you slip and you cut into there, it's, you can't hide that. You're, you're screwed, so to speak. That's not a technical term. So I've come up with a, a tool. I call it my golf ball skew. And this is a Marple's skew chisel that I've had for a bazillion years. It's those ones, you remember when they had those blue plastic handles? I could never, I never liked those. This is one of my favorite handles, a golf ball. And you can find these just walk by any golf course and they'll be laying out in the street. I use these on the ends of my files. Um, I use it on the end of my burnisher. What I like about it, it has some texture. And unlike a wooden handle, you know, like on a chisel, I can grab this and turn it any way that I want. So I've found, and I'm not gonna do it because I want this to be um, securely clamped. By taking this, I can get on this line and I can manipulate that chisel. This is almost like steering it. As long as I can see my line, which was hard to do with the dividers, as long as I can see that line, I can incise this and then start to ground it out and work the design from there. Then if you're, if you're carved, you know, I can now I can look at this one and this one and try to at least make these two on this corner look the same and then get the other four corners the same as well. Um, this frame, by the way, is one I'm working on. Charles Douglas, uh, who has a gilding studio and uh, who I've taken a, a class from, is doing an online class in January on this, uh, the Dutch black finish. And so this frame is going to be used for that class. Well, I hope you kind of enjoyed what you saw here. And if there's information you can use, 
that's just all the better, and uh, thanks for watching.